Everybody knew the Plume family as a problem family. I've seen knives thrown. I knew a lot about God, but I didn't actually know God personally. I was run over by a car while riding my bicycle. I wept profusely. I knew Christ had come into my life. And our car was almost totally wiped out by a double articulated unit. And Christ, I'm more in love with him now today than I ever been. Hello and welcome to another edition of My Story. Today we have waylaid a friend of ours on his way back from uh, North Yorkshire, back to East Anglia, and so we want to welcome Bernard Plume. Hello Thank you, Bernard. Jane. Hi, and it's lovely a pleasure to do this today, Jan. Yeah. yeah, we've known Bernard for a good many years and when we were in Bury St Edmunds area, we knew that you were a preacher and you led worship and we never knew that when you were a child, you weren't quite so forthcoming with things. So tell us a little bit about your early life. Okay, Jan, well, it's an interesting thing for me because I was born in 1950. And when I look back now on a computer, I have to scroll down a long way to yeah, find my true. date of birth. <laughs> um, and being born in 1950 means I grew up in what I'll call a very black and white world. Uh, when I entered my teenage years, um, suddenly in the 60s, the world sprang into colour for me. So quite an amazing experience. But of a lot I could tell you about growing up in our interesting home. <laughs> yeah, well, tell us a little bit. What was your home like? OK, I was the uh, last of five siblings. In fact, my mother told me that I was, I think she called it an unexpected surprise <laughs> right. to the extent that I wasn't really welcomed in that sense. So I think mm. it, it sowed seeds of low self-esteem and yeah. rejection into my spirit. Um, I would describe my dad as a lovely man who loved me, physically present but emotionally absent. Um, my mother loved me, but it was a very domineering and a controlling right. love. Mm -hmm. um, and mum had mental health issues, dad had alcohol problems. So it was difficult for me growing up because all my brothers and sisters had left home to escape the rather unhealthy atmosphere. Mm, so you're like an early, only child, really? Very much so. Yeah. And I would probably say that the issues in the home got worse and worse because mum was frustrated. Uh, she felt her life was wasted. And it was like bitterness and frustration just was like a flower. It came into full bloom as I was growing up. Yeah, oh, that's sad. So how did that affect you at school and things like that? Quite powerfully because I cannot remember going to sleep as a child without hearing fights and arguments and I've seen knives thrown and other stuff that I won't embellish. Bury St Edmunds, the town I grew up in, was a very small market rural town mm. back in those days. Everybody knew the Plume family as a problem family. Oh, really? Oh, very much so. I think today we would have been labelled as a dysfunctional family. Yeah. Um, so going to school, uh, often, I, as we say, I had the mickey taken out of me. Yeah. I was quite overweight. I lacked confidence. I think physically I was a slow developer. Mm. My mother also worked as a cleaner in the ladies' washroom. That was regularly levelled against me. And there are wonderful school teachers out there, Jan, but I seem to be educated by a bunch of sadists for some reason <laughs> um, who seem to zero in on my inadequacy. So yeah. if we compounded all those factors together, I was shy, I was insecure, and I grew up with a chip on both shoulders, actually, because Mother yeah. said, the whole town hates us, and that was my attitude as I got into teenage years. So how did you come out of that? I think when I was five or six, and this is going to date my age, I used to love matchbox cars. Yeah, um, yeah. Older people will recall them. I could not afford dinky cars. They were the more expensive versions. Yeah. My sister then, who was a Christian, a very young Christian, said, if you come to Sunday school, Bernard, I'll give you a matchbox car for each time you came. Um, <laughs> it was something to do. I was escaping the home atmosphere, and so I went along to Sunday school. Years passed very, very quickly. I think because I was shy, I didn't mix very well socially. Mm. Um, and so the church had a youth club. I used to go along to that for something to do. It was an evangelical Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. Regular appeals were made. I heard the gospel many, many times. And I would put my hand up to these appeals, but it meant nothing to me because I was just simply 
following the crowd. Uh -huh. In fact, the pastor once said to me, well, you know what to do now, don't you, Bernard? <laughs> so as I think I was a young teen, everybody thought he's a very nice, clean cut man. I knew a lot about God, but I didn't actually know God personally. So were you working then or were you at a school? Uh, I was, I'd probably be about 17, I think. I just yeah. started at work and, of course, again, slowly gaining confidence, but I was terribly shy around young girls. And later on, God introduced me to my wife, who's the most lovely God-sent gift I could ever have in my life. But maybe that'll come into the story a little bit Indeed later. Indeed it will. <laughs> so everybody thought I was a Christian, Jan, because I gave all the evidence of it. I was polite and well-spoken, but... Yeah. Inside, I certainly was not, and I let my mind go into some very nasty, uh, difficult places, which, again, I won't go into. But to get to my conversion, Billy Graham, folks might recall him, the late Dr. Billy Graham, mm -hmm. in those days, I think they were called crusades, a very old-fashioned word. Indeed, and yes. he was in London, and there was a telecast that was being beamed to Cambridge. And so I got on the bus and I went to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I listened to him preach and he talked about God being realer than your mother, your father, your brother or sister. And I thought, I would really like to know God like that. I felt convicted of my hypocrisy, my pretend Christianity. Yeah. I wasn't a bad person. I didn't take drugs or anything like that. I was Mr. Uber clean, but I was still a sinner in God's sight. Mm. And it got to the end and Billy Graham made, as we call the appeal, where people were invited down the front to respond. Yeah. And they used to sing a very old fashioned hymn, but it's a lovely one called Just As I Am. As it got to the very last verse of that hymn, very shakily I stood to my feet, began to go to the front of the cinema. Mm. I had not gone two steps before God met me. I wept profusely. I knew Christ had come into my life most amazingly, which has never left me. Uh, and in, in those days, they had what they call counsellors or advisors. So I yeah. sat down to an, an advisor. A slightly funny story. The advisor had very bad breath. Oh dear, that's it, unfortunate. It, it was. It was difficult to listen to him. Mm. It didn't matter. I knew that Jesus had come into my heart. Yes. And he gave me a little booklet and some Bible verses to memorise. Yeah. Uh, and I went back to share this with my family. And what did they say? Well, my father said to me in his good old Suffolk accent, he said, oh, boy, I'm going to give it two weeks. Well, at the time of filming this interview, I'm 72. So it's been with me for the majority of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And Christ, I'm more in love with him now today than I ever have been. I'm more passionate about sharing the Christian message than I've ever been. So it's lasted a long time, hasn't, hasn't it? Hasn't it just? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go away. The Lord doesn't go away. So, Bernard, did you find that coming to Jesus made a difference in your life regarding your insecurities and all that sort of thing? For me, it's been a lifelong journey, Jan. Uh -huh. um, uh, there are still traces of that with me, um, but it's no longer the major problem it once was. Mm. What I find amazing is that God seemed to give me gifts that were very front-facing. Yeah. Um, so, for example, public speaking, I've led mm. mission teams, I've led worship and a whole host of other stuff. Yes. In my natural person, that's the very last thing I want to do. I want to be at the back of the room. And I think God did that almost with a sense of humour <laughs> because it's like he knew I couldn't do it without his strength. Mm. And I preach regularly today in a number of churches and overseas and people say, well, you look so confident and calm and composed. And I said, yes, but inside I'm desperately calling out to God. Yeah. Um, so I thank God for giving me those ministry gifts and gradually I grew into them and I was a pastor at quite a young age, about 22, I think. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, although mm -hmm. I believe that there are many shades of God's lovely worldwide family. Yes, indeed. And we, we love, I, I love the, what we call the Pentecostal experience. And in those days, when we said we were seeking God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, yes. they had a thing called a receiving meeting. Oh. Oh, yes. It, it sounds weird, doesn't it? And I went along to a big Christian conference and Christians have different opinions on this, so I'll share in this context. In that particular denomination, they look for you to speak in tongues as evidence that the Spirit had come inside. Right. And so I describe it as Christian musical chairs, because I entered a room where there were back-to-back -back seats, and the great pastoral preachers would come and lay hands on you. Cunningly, I placed myself in the middle row. I was convinced by the time he got to me, nobody would know whether I had or hadn't. Guess who he started with first? He started with moi. He started with me. 
He laid his hands on me and I was expecting some incredible feelings, shivering and shakings, nothing, just a few syllables came into my mind. Uh -huh. And God quietly inside me said, stand to your feet and speak out. I did right. and the gift of tongues came and as we say, I was away. Now, the next morning I woke up in my chalet because it was being held in a butlins camp. All right. And my uh, uh, chalet mate said to me, what happened to you? And I described it and I went in to shave in the mirror and I thought, I wonder if I can still do this. <laughs> and I spoke in tongues shaving in the mirror and I thought, what a wonderful thing. And since then, I have known the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on my ministry. It's a precious gift and I revere it and I honor the Trinity in my life. Yes, that's wonderful. Yes, it's so necessary, isn't it, to have the power of God in order to be able to do his work that he's given us. It is not based in my physical efforts. No. It's God alone. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you've done on missions and things like that. Uh, obviously, we could talk for ages about pastoring. Maybe one experience in pastoring is, plus of my rejection background, yes. I wasn't very good at confrontation. Uh -huh. uh, now, you'll understand in pastoring, you do have to confront people about their lives, their lifestyles. I never found it easy. I still don't but I found that God would give me an insight into what was needed and I could speak it out even into the lives of fellow leaders without fear. And that's not an arrogant statement. No. It's a statement about my confidence in God speaking to my life. The missions, uh, I've done a lot of short-term missions. It started very undramatically. Um, a friend of mine said he was going to India um, for maybe a couple of three months. Mm -hmm. And I simply responded quickly, can I come? Oh. And he said, yes, you can. <laughs> and quite amazingly, there was going to be this big team of 20 people. It ended up with just the two of us. Really? Mm. Wow, that's a different thing. We spoke in North and South India, and I, I have a special affection for the Indian people. Yes. Saw some amazing sights. I have memories of going into a hill tribe, and there were seven different dialects, and I was asked to tell a children's story. <laughs> and so I had to go through seven interpreters. Wow. And you can imagine that a 10-minute sermon became an hour, so yes. I had to work closely mm -hmm. on that. Um, since then, I've visited probably at least 13 different countries. Mm -hmm. I've seen the wonder of God's church in many cultures, which yeah. I honour. Um, I've led people on mission teams, and that to me, going back to my original background, is just amazing to have the confidence to do that. What I can say is God's church is alive and well in lots of shapes and sizes. Yes, indeed it is. All across the world. Yes, and isn't heaven going to be an amazing place? I have no idea what songs we'll sing up there. It'll be the song <laughs> of the Lamb, but whether it's Hill's song or Sankey's and Moody's, who knows, hey? <laughs> be wonderful. And it's always been lovely to uh, worship with you leading, also alongside you sometimes in the band. <laughs> It, it is, and um, I, can, I can't sight read, but I can play competently well. Yeah. And in a Pentecostal sense, we tend to, as we say, fly by the seat of our pants, just see where God has taken us. So exactly. there's a structure, but yes. you know what happened there. Again, that to me is amazing because when you think that you're actually speaking words that you say God has mm. given you, then great uh, respect and caution must go into the action. So yes. I never say what I'll call froth and bubble. No. Um, I will only speak what I think God has given me. But I'm able to relax when I'm worshipping, and it's, yes. it's a lovely place to be. Yes. And you all know, Jen, you lead worship yourself as you're worshipping. We see people healed. Yeah. We see people released, for which we are careful to give God all the glory. Yes, amen. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, interestingly, I was reminded as I read your little resume that you've had several near-death experiences, shall I say. I'd like to touch on those because I do believe that when we're in the Lord's service, the old enemy is at work as well. Very much so, Jen. I do believe that we do have a destiny. Yeah. absolutely conscious that God has a plan for my life and that I will not depart this earth one microsecond sooner absolutely. than he says I can yeah, go. I, I, As you say, three near deaths. The first one was when I was a younger man, uh, 19 years of age, riding my bicycle to work. I turned correctly at a junction, mm. um, but a car with faulty brakes couldn't stop oh. and went right over the top of me. Now, uh, again, I'll date myself, but there used to be a cartoon called Wally Coyote where he would get flattened <laughs> by the roadrunner. And I crawled from underneath this car and the man was shaking like a leaf. And I, I, I merely so. then tapped on the windscreen and said, that wasn't very clever, was it? <laughs> 
Um, and he said, you should be dead. I said, yes, I should, but no thanks to you. But without a shadow of a doubt, um, God preserved my life. Um, wow. My second experience, we were returning from a mission trip to Uganda. And uh, I was looking out of the plane window and I saw that they were jettisoning, um, uh, you know, aircraft fuel. And I thought, that's not good. And then the pilot said, we have two engine malfunctions and we're going to have to do a crash landing. Oh. Um, and so, yes, we went through the whole brace, brace thing. We landed safely. And little did I know that there was a Ugandan senior politician on the same flight. Um, so uh, God took care of me then. But again, it could have been a death incident. Yes. Um, the third one, which could have been tragic, we'd had a lovely holiday with our middle son and his family. And we stopped on the way back from our journey on the motorway. And he said a very touching thing to me. He said, Dad, that's a lovely holiday. You and Mum are the best parents ever. And I said, yes, I know. Thank you, son. Joking with him. Uh, we carried on. And in Suffolk in those days, there was a road called the A14. Indeed. Um, I mm. won't mention the location, but it was a two lane. And I was overtaking a double articulated unit left-hand drive he totally lost me in his mirror and he pulled out and caught us with the middle of the trailer we were then catapulted into the barrier to our right we were spun round until we were being pushed if you imagine i'm looking up like that at the face of the lorry driver who was as white as sheet and instantly in my mind my dear wife was screaming and I thought, am I looking at my killer? Mm. We spun round again and we were being dragged along the road. Wow. We'll cut the story short. Eventually we came to a halt. We both got out with minor injuries and we essentially said, yes, God has preserved our life. The whole family turned up. And I, I said, if ever you doubted that God has a plan, you've just seen it. Because this right. is the third time yes. that I've walked away from what should have been my death. Yeah. And we look back now that Jan was, well, a number of years ago, and I think I would not have seen this, I would not have seen that. I've looked at all the things that have happened subsequent to that event, and I can truthfully say that someone wanted to take us out. Yes. Our God is sovereign, he's in control, Absolutely. and we rejoice. Yeah. I don't really want any more near-death experiences, if possible. <laughs> I agree. <Yeah. laughs> And every time we hear this song, Bernard, we remember you. So now you're married to Christina. Tell us about your lovely wife. I'm the more vocal of the partnership in public. She's probably the more vocal in private. Um, she's not afraid to straighten me out, and she does. Um, she's a woman who hears God very clearly, and she'll often say to me, are you really sure about that? And it's a good safety check. We have three adult children, our three grandchildren, and I personally think she's the best wife, mother, and nanny in the whole world. Would you like to know how we actually met? Oh, yes, that was a good idea. We both work for the retailer WH Smith & Son. Oh. In those days, um, I was still quite a nice young man in a suit, and Christina came, and I believe it was Christina's sister who said, why don't you go out with that nice Mr. Plume? And she said a word to the effect of, oh, yuck. <laughs> I don't really want to go out with him. And bear in mind, I said I was very nervous in those days. Yeah. Um, so Christina started coming to church, and I used to pick her up as she lived in a nearby village. And uh, at the end of a prayer meeting, I was going to drop her off. And I said, um, I wonder, uh, do you think maybe uh, would you uh, um, uh, would you like to go out with me? And I really stuttered it out. And I was so nervous, I actually wound one of the knobs in my car off the socket. That's so nervous was my <laughs> delivery. And she said, no, I can't. And I was most upset. She said, I can't do it on that day, but I can do it on so-and-so. <laughs> and quite amazingly, she was prepared to go out with me. And we've had a very precious lifelong relationship since. Um, she is my rock and she keeps me in a safe place. Excellent. 
<laughs> and you have a ministry together, I believe. We do. Um, uh, I don't want to demean it. I believe it's a powerful ministry. Yeah. We've called it Fruitful Bow Ministry. It's based on the story of Joseph having lots of opposition, but still coming through. Yes. We've had a lot of opposition as a couple and in mm. our leadership roles. We've come through. We're still going strong, Jan. So yes, what we do very simply is we'll go out and preach or lead worship wherever God yeah. takes us. We're at our strongest, I think, as a couple um, when we pray ministry together with people and oh, we, yes. we seem to bounce off each other. God yeah. will give me a word or Christina. Mm. And it's almost like two things will dovetail together beautifully. And we're thankful that people find release as we pray for them. Are we anything special? No, we're just people who love Jesus. This is it, isn't it? You know, people look to the big ministries and things like that, but each one of us needs to know what's our place in the body, what does God want me to do? And you found out with Christina, that's wonderful. It, it yeah. is, and, and we're thrilled. We're still now in our 70s, still ministering. I personally, or we have been trying to retire for the last seven years. Uh, we don't worry about status or position, but Christina, and this is where she uh, intersected into my life again, I said, we need to retire. And she said, has God told you that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I said, well, actually, perhaps I should ask him. Yeah. And no, God didn't ask me to retire. I don't want to be somebody who should, you know, be beyond their sell by date, if I can put it that way. But we're still being used by God. So we've decided we'll just keep going. Absolutely. And I we are. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I don't think there's a retirement age in the kingdom of God. Not at all. And yeah. I think Fruitful Bow Ministry, to bounce off the name, Jan, is mm. at the moment we're enjoying our most fruitful period ever in all the 50 plus or whatever number of years it is a ministry. And we give God the praise. The word of God says they will bear fruit in old age. That's right. We yes. certainly are. Yes. Wonderful. So what is it you're doing now? Well, we are currently working with two churches. We were invited to have leadership roles, but we declined those. We're happy just to be in the congregation. Um, so at one church, which has a lot of people with very real challenges in their lives, mm -hmm. we are engaging in prayer ministry. Yeah. Uh, I'm helping to lead worship. I'm preaching again. In the secondary church, it's almost a duplicate of that, but instead of preaching, I'm doing discussional style uh, Bible events. We've done all sorts of lovely courses, everything from Alpha to Freedom in Christ to name yeah. but a few, and we still continue to see lives being changed by God's power. Yes, the first time I heard your name, Bernard, was when we f I first got married to David and moved up to Suffolk to be with him, and I went to work at British Sugar uh -huh. and you had just left and everyone when they heard I was a Christian they said oh do you know Bernard Plume oh you should know Bernard you should meet Bernard <laughs> and you must have borne a very good witness there I think because they all looked to you as being you know the Christian so that's good. Uh, uh, number one, that's the first time I've heard that, Jan, and I find that greatly encouraging. I Thank hope you so. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I've held a number of jobs, Smiths, as I say. Um, I worked for nearly 20 years for British Sugar. I had some tough times there. I can tell you a quick story about that. Mm -hmm. I had a work colleague who was the bane of my life. Uh, he would constantly try to aggravate me. In fact, on one particular occasion, he aggravated me so much that a rather naughty word escaped my lips. And he ran up and down the work corridor saying, the Christian swore, the Christian swore, <laughs> which he thought was highly amusing. Mm. Um, but I did try to maintain a faithful witness in that place. On the day I left, that same colleague came up to me put his arms around me, was actually crying and said, you're the only real friend I've ever had in this workplace. My repost was, I'd like to have known that 19 years ago. <laughs> I would think so. Yeah. But, but yes, so you were there 19 years, I was there you? 20 in total um, and then moved on to work for the police. And quite interestingly, a similar thing, I still get comebacks from my former colleagues to say, thank you for witnessing for me in the police, which wasn't necessarily easy. Evidently. You bear witness wherever you go, and that's tremendous, isn't it? I try to live by my life, Jan. I wouldn't say I have the gift of an evangelist. I'm better at teaching God's people God's yeah. word. Yeah. I have a passion for it being taught accurately. So is God working in your family? He's working all the time, Jan, but a one, not historic, but a precious experience we had. Um, our daughter, Michelle, uh, has produced two lovely grandchildren. One is called Sophia, one is called Noah. Now, when Michelle was going to give birth 
to Sophia. She had a very traumatic experience giving birth. She nearly bled out. Um, she had multiple blood transfusions. Wow. And our son was told, you need to prepare for losing your wife. Mm. Uh, uh, the other mother-in-law very graciously said to me, well, you're the man who knows him upstairs. You better pray. And I stood by the bedside looking at this lady with all the wires and monitors and everything. And uh, as it were, God dropped a Bible verse into my heart. Mm. And the Bible verse says that she shall not die, but she shall live and declare the glory of God in the land of the living. I took that as a promise and I prayed that. And then as some of us Christians would say, I think God gave me a prophetic word as well. Yeah. And so I prophesied that because uh, Matthew had been told that Michelle probably would not be able to have any more children and they were going to perform a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And I prophesied that this would not be her only child. Yes. And so it transpired to be because she's followed on a number of years later to have our grandson. So her life was delivered and two grandchildren and I praise God and give him all the glory. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? Such an encouragement. So Bernard, you've given us a lot to think about as we've been talking. And I wonder, would you like to pray for anybody who has perhaps that insecurity that you used to have? Right. Or who wants to know their place in God or however you, the Holy Spirit leads you to pray? I'd be delighted and it's an honour. Yeah. It's a pleasure to pray to God today and a privilege to pray for you. Maybe some of you are like me, that you suffer from low self-esteem and rejection and, and you feel that you'll never be anything in this life. I'm going to pray for you right now that God will deal with that. So dear Lord Jesus, in your precious name, anybody who is suffering particularly from rejection and low self-esteem, may they know today that you love them that you care for them, that you have a purpose and a plan in their life, I pray that you will free them. And whether like me it's over the long haul or whether it's instantly, I believe you can do that for them right now, Lord. For any person today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for you right now that you'll come to know him as your Lord and Saviour and that one day you'll join me and billions of other people praising Jesus in heaven. We ask this in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to receive Jesus Christ into your life, perhaps you'd like to say a short prayer, sentence by sentence after me. Let's do it now. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I know I need your forgiveness. Would you please cleanse me, forgive me, and welcome me into your family. I turn from my sin I receive you as my saviour. Thank you for coming into my life and making me your child. Amen. Thank you, Bernard, very much. It's been lovely to talk to you and to, to hear more about your life. Thank you. And it's an honour and thank you, Jane.